Hey everybody, in this next video lesson, we're gonna start out with the introductory notes on gas laws and their properties. We need to begin by starting to think about how gas particles behave in a sample of gas. This is what is known as the kinetic molecular theory, as you can see at the top. Now there's a couple of assumptions that we need to consider when we're talking about gases. And these assumptions help us make for easier and less complicated math. But when you're thinking about a sample of gas, we need to think about what the molecules are doing and what they look like. This first point says that molecules of a gas move rapidly and in constant linear motion. So they're not curving, they're going straight. They may collide and bounce off of each other, or maybe the walls of the container that they're in, but they always travel in a straight line or linear fashion. Next, molecules only change direction when they come in contact with other molecules or the wall of the container. So imagine this box as a container and these little particles are the gas particles. They'll travel straight and then bounce off the wall or they'll collide with another particle. That's the only time they actually change direction. Now, there's something called the ideal gas and it's like the perfect gas, the gas that behaves the most gas-like. And we are going to assume that all of our real gases that we encounter every day, the oxygen gas, the carbon dioxide gas, the nitrogen, the helium, the neon, all the gases are assumed to behave like the perfect or the ideal gas. Now you might be asking yourself, how does the ideal gas behave? Well, that's what we're gonna talk about next. The ideal gas behaves according to the following assumptions. First of all, all the collisions between the molecules of the ideal gas are completely elastic. The term elastic means that there is no net change in the kinetic energy. And so when they collide with each other, they are traveling the same kinetic energy after the collisions as they were before. Maybe they might transfer some of their energy to a slower moving particle. Well, then that particle that got collided with is now absorbed the full energy. Now this isn't true in real situations because real gases do get affected by the collisions and they may slow down. Oftentimes in our experiences when things collide with the wall, if there's large massive objects that are maybe like rolling along the ground, they lose energy because of friction. Maybe they lose energy to heat, things of that nature. But we're gonna assume that any collisions do not result in a change in kinetic energy. Now the next one is that there is no attractive forces between the molecules of gas. What that means is that when they come in contact with each other, there is no intramolecular forces. Now, once again, that's not true of real gases, but ideal gases are affected by the intramolecular forces and may be attracted to other gas particles. But in this case, these two kind of go along together. When they collide, they do not attract each other. And as a result, they're completely elastic or they don't slow down. Finally, the particles itself have no volume compared to the total volume of the gas. So we all know that gas particles are made up of molecules and molecules have mass and molecules have volume. But the amount of volume that the gas occupies is so large compared to the actual volume of the true particles that we just assume that the particles do not contribute to the total volume. And so the particle has no volume in our understanding of the ideal gas. Fortunately, we live in a world where real gases act very similar to the ideal gas. The only time you have to worry about real gases not behaving ideally is in certain atmospheric conditions when it gets really, really cold or at very, very high pressures. But we're going to talk about that near the end of this chapter. Now you've seen this slide before because this was actually in our intermolecular forces chapter, but it's important to kind of ground ourselves in some ideas of what gases are. They are able to expand and fill any space. They're compressible and free to move with no attractive forces. In other words, intermolecular forces are not in effect in gases. Now the properties, as we talked about, of gases are based on what are known as the kinetic molecular theory. And that was the last set of slides that we just talked about, how they're collisions are elastic and there's no intermolecular forces and their volume doesn't contribute to the total volume of the gas. Now there are four different ways to describe gases, or in other words, there are four variables. It's pressure, temperature, amount of particles, and volume. And all of these are interconnected with one another. If you change one, another one changes. And so sometimes some of these variables are held constant, but at other times they're not. And we're going to investigate what happens to the temperature when the pressure changes or what happens to the volume when the pressure changes. And that's the whole basis of this chapter is the study of the variables of gas. Now let's talk about each one of these variables individually and volume and amount, you know, 
so we're not going to spend too much time talking about these. But the volume is the space occupied by a substance. Now, in this unit, we consider gases expanded to fill their entire container. So if we want to know the volume of the gas, what we really are saying is we know the volume of the container that the gas is in. Usually, it's measured in milliliters, or some cases, liters. Now, in terms of amount, in chemistry, amount is the moles. The amount of substance is measured in moles. We learned about the moles back in the stoichiometry unit. And so when we're talking about the amount of gas particles, we're going to not measure them in grams, which is the measure of mass. We're going to measure moles, or the amount of particles. Now, up until this point, we abbreviated moles, M-O-L. But in the gas laws, there's a special designation for moles, and that is used lowercase letter n, as in number of moles. The variable that I want to spend a decent amount of time talking about today is pressure. Pressure is basically the measure of force of the particles striking the inner surface of the container that they're in. All gases are contained inside a container. Oftentimes it's a balloon or maybe it's this cubicle box. And every time a particle strikes the wall, it applies some pressure. Now all these particles are striking the wall, some at faster speeds than others, because we know that the particles are moving at a various number of speeds. Some are slow, some are fast. But if you total up all of the kinetic energy of the particles striking the inner surface of the container of gas, what you get is the pressure. There are many ways to make the pressure increase or decrease. A lot of it has to do with how fast the particles are moving or how small a space the particles are, are packed into. But basically, more particles or faster moving particles will create more pressure. Now, the three most common labels for pressure are atmospheres, ATM, millimeters of mercury, which is kind of an older pressure unit. And we'll talk about how that comes to be in a second. And the other one is called the Pascal. Now, Pascal is a very, very small unit of measure when it comes to pressure. So oftentimes we scale that up by a factor of 1,000, and we call it a kilopascal or 1,000 pascals. These are the three most common labels for pressure units. Now, it's easy to convert between them one atmosphere is equal to 760.0 millimeters of mercury. So if you use just basic dimensional analysis, you can convert from atmospheres to millimeters of mercury or millimeters of mercury to atmospheres. Frankly, I think millimeters of mercury is kind of a terrible pressure unit. It's old timey. It doesn't really apply to current or modern understanding of pressure. So I almost always either measure my pressures in atmospheres or kilopascals and even kilopascals is kind of cumbersome. So, I personally like atmospheres because it's easy. It's one, whereas millimeters of mercury is 760. Now, another conversion from atmospheres to kilopascals is 101.325. Oftentimes, we just say 101 kilopascals for every one atmosphere. So if you just use basic dimensional analysis, you can convert between the three different pressure units. We're not going to do any examples of that because I'd expect you to know how to do that at this point. Now, we can't talk about a pressure of a gas or a sample of gas without talking also about atmospheric pressure. Atmospheric pressure is kind of the opposite force of a gas trying to escape, pushing on the inner surface of a balloon, so to speak. Well, the atmospheric pressure is the pressure of the gas pushing against the outer surface of the balloon if that sample of gas was indeed trapped inside a balloon. And so there's always this tug of war, more like a, a push against another push. They're, they're opposite forces. The pressure of a gas inside a container is always trying to get out, where the atmospheric pressure is always trying to keep it in. And so you get this gas pressure force that is pushing out, where the atmospheric pressure pressure force pushing in. And if you have the force of the pressure pushing out and the force of the pressure pushing in equally, then they reach this level of equilibrium, where the pressure out is equal to the pressure in. And so we always pay attention to what's happening atmospherically. Because if the atmospheric pressure decreases, the pressure of the gas inside the container may be allowed to expand and move into a larger volume. And so atmospheric pressure is always counteracting the pressure of the gas trying to get out of the container. Now I talked about how millimeters of mercury is kind of a, a weird unit when it comes to measuring pressure, but it comes from this whole idea kind of, of atmospheric pressure affecting the pressure of gases. Now if you have a dish of mercury down here and you fill a tube of mercury all the way up, inside a vacuum condition, the atmospheric pressure will basically push down on the surface and force the mercury up this column. And at sea level, that height of the mercury will be exactly 760 millimeters or 76 centimeters in height. And so that's how they get that pressure known as 760 millimeters of mercury, which represents the height of a column of mercury inside a vacuum tube 
if the atmospheric pressure was allowed to push on the liquid and force it up a tube. This is the old way that they measured pressure way, way back before digital instrumentation was known about. Now, we also know about temperature, and so I'm not going to spend too much time talking about temperature as well. And we've already talked about kind of what temperature measures in the last chapter when we talked about intermolecular forces. But the temperature measures the average kinetic energy of a system. Recall that all the particles aren't necessarily moving the same speed, but if you factor in all the particles and all the various speeds that they're traveling and average them, you will get the temperature or the average kinetic energy of the moving particles. As you give particles more kinetic energy, it makes sense that that would result in a higher temperature. And that's true. Temperature and the speed of the particles are directly related. So if you add heat to a set of particles that are trapped inside a container, they will begin to move faster as the heat is applied. But if you remove the kinetic energy from the particles, they will slow down, and as a result, the temperatures will cool. So you want to slow the particles down, put it on ice, or put it in a cooler environment, and the particles will begin to move more slowly, and as a result, they will not have as much kinetic energy. Now, as we know, temperature is measured in degrees Celsius, but when it comes to gases, we want to make sure that the temperature is measured in Kelvin. And don't forget that in order to calculate the temperature in Kelvin, you take the degrees Celsius and add 273 to convert to Kelvin. And that's really important in doing any math involving gas laws in this chapter. Well, that takes care of this video. Thanks for watching.